everyone. Welcome to the Kushwant Singh Literary Festival London. I'm sure many of you will have been here on earlier occasions when we've gathered in London in person um, to celebrate the life and work of Kushwant Singh. But even online, I think we can still have some real flavour of him and his work and his times, perhaps. Um, and welcome to you all. So the, the Literary Festival is to promote the legacy of Kushwant Singh, who was an author, a scholar, journalist and iconoclast, and we discuss the values he stood for and address his concerns. London is a place where we do this because he worked and studied here, and this shaped many of his ideas in his later life. He's interested in a closer ties between India and Pakistan, equal opportunities for women, and disseminating values of democracy, tolerance, and compassion. And one of his major concerns was also ecology. And in the festival, we give all the speakers um, a, a certificate about planting a tree for them in the Sundarbans area of West Bengal. Now, this leads me on very nicely to today's talk between Professor Wendy Doniger and Professor Arshia Sutter, who are two old friends of mine, and I very much wish that we could welcome them in person to London today. In fact, the last time we all met was here in London, though we met on many continents before. Um, Arshia Sutter, you probably know from her work on translations. Um, she was Wendy's student in the 1980s, um, at the University of Chicago, where she did a PhD in South Asian languages and civilization. And her major work has been in the epics, um, particularly her translations of the Ramayana, though she's also translated the Qatar Sarit Sagra and many other texts. And many of you will also know her work, um, her work writing shorter pieces in magazines and newspapers and online in India. So she's an ideal person to be talking to Professor Wendy Doniger, who in the manner of all eminent people has given me a ridiculously short CV here, which doesn't <laughs> do anything to encapsulate um, her great contribution to the world of South Asian studies and storytelling more widely. So many books with so many titles that I can hardly begin um, to mention them, although I remember being fascinated them when I, by them when I was an undergraduate many years ago, as she formerly taught in my home institution, SOAS, mm. and wrote books with wonderful titles like Women, Androgynes, and Other Mythical Beasts. Um, and that's always my favourite, of course, of her book, but she's probably known to a new generation through her volumes on Hinduism which came out lately and not without some controversy, which I think Kushwant Singh would have loved. But I think Kushwant Singh would really like to have met Wendy at the time she wrote this book, because he was always fond of beautiful young women, though I know we shouldn't say <laughs> that these days. And Wendy's remarkable book, um, which is just coming out with Speaking Tiger in Delhi, is called An American Girl in India. Um, letters and recollections of her time there as a student in 1963 to 4. And it's a fascinating document, as Arshia will, of course, be telling us, because, you know, this is about initial impressions of somebody who went on to hold one of the most prestigious positions in South Asian studies, and I can never pronounce this properly, um, Wendy Mercia Eliada, is that near um, um, Professor distinguished service professor at the University of Chicago, now emerita, um, and working on the history of religion. Now this, this book, I think, will be of great interest to many looking back at the historical document as well as Wendy's own personal life. So I'll hand it over to you, Arshia, and I look forward to joining you again for the discussion. Welcome both to a virtual London. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. And hello, hello, Wendy. Hello, Arsha. <laughs> Together How are again. You today. Together <laughs> again. Um, you know, uh, Rachel very 
um, correctly introduced, said that I was your student, but I do want to say that I'm still your student. And I will always be your student. And you will always be my teacher. But having said that, I also want to say um, that you are really one of my dearest friends. And um, people know you as a scholar. Many of us have the great good fortune of personally. And, um, you know, your warmth, your generosity, your sense of humor, your sense of loyalty, um, all of that is visible in this book when you were 22 years old. And I, I think that that is fantastic that even people who don't you personally get to enjoy um, that, that part of you, you know, the, the person behind all the degrees and the accolades and the big chairs and, you know, uh, and the beautiful Indian shawls and the red lipstick. And, um, so, um, were you prepared for India in any way at 22? It was a big shock to me when I got there. I was so sheltered. I really haven't been out of the States. I was brought up, upper middle class parents and so on. So when I found these letters, which had been lost for 50 years, I started reading them. I was embarrassed, sometimes shocked by the naivete, my, my attitudes toward things like race and gender, which we do so differently now. There were a lot of the letters which I found embarrassing. And when I presented the book to my wonderful publisher, Bobby Singh, I said, I want to cut this, I want to cut this, I'm ashamed of this, we can't publish this, we can't publish this, let's cut this. And he said, no, I'm comfortable, leave it in. But apologize for it by the preface saying when I said X and Y, I was wrong, or I changed my mind, or that's what we thought then. So he made the book into a kind of a dialogue between my young, spoiled brat self that was never seen, I'd never seen poor people before, I'd never seen the slums, <laughs> I've never seen the slums of New York, and then I'm in Calcutta. So, yeah, ah, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, my, yeah. so he said, leave that in and then explain who you were and how you've changed, how you would say these things, how you understand better what, what, what you saw then. So the book came, came to me kind of a dialogue between my 81-year-old self and my 22-year-old self. And it became also an exercise in something that we're all doing which is contemplating the stupidity of who we were 50 years ago and apologizing for it and trying not to do it anymore. We just embrace the gender, change our pronouns, use certain words that can So this book is about that too. It's about who I was then and who I am now and how I have to apologize for a lot. But at the same time, I loved India. I met wonderful people. I got them, I described them well. They came off the page. You can see that I wasn't an idiot. No, you were not an uh, idiot. You were a young 22 <laughs> year old girl in the 1960s. You know, you were I was a spoiled creature. Rat for, yes. <laughs> that may be, but you were very much a creature of your time, you know. Yeah. Um, but when you were reading the letters, uh, did you remember that girl or was she just a stranger to you? I remembered her. She had the same sense of humor. The letters are funny. She yeah, makes this. Yeah. I kept putting in footnotes explaining all the jokes. That I did. Yeah. I did a lot of yeah, 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 I, yeah. I recognized her. So there are a lot of places where I said, I heard this wonderful story and I tell it. And I tell it wrong. I tell the story of Saranyu and how she turns into the bear. But I got a lot of the details wrong. So I left it in. But then I wrote a whole book about her 10 years yeah. later. So there's a footnote that says, this story is not exactly right, but I got it right yeah. when I published the book about yeah. the title yeah. of the book. So it's like yeah. seeing a bud that's going to turn into a flower someday. And you can see, yeah. the, or you can see the love of India, the passion for Shiva, mm -hmm. the passion for the landscape, the people, loving the people that I met and getting them down, quoting what they said, the characters, and so forth. So, the essence is there, but there's just a lot of mistakes, a lot of naive generalizations. It's, and the other thing yeah. that that I left things out then, 
because I was writing for my parents. And you don't tell everything to your parents. So you I don't. Tell it to my parents. Yeah. So yeah. then I wrote other footnotes in this conversation between the me and the, and the her, where I said, well, for instance, I went to a goat sacrifice. Talk about how they took the goat and the priest got the goat by the horns and somebody else grabbed it by the hind legs and they pulled them and they pulled them and then they scimitar came down and the head sprang away and the blood spurted <laughs> and at that point I said well at that point I needed a bit of air so when I wrote to my parents I needed a bit of air what I did say was I passed out cold fell on the ground <laughs> had to be carried out my friends missed the whole rest of the ceremony people had to fan me and give me water to drink and things like that so in the 81 year old part of the conversation I put in the things that I that I censored, kind of parental guidance in reverse, things that I censored parents. So, so that's the dialogue. Yeah. You know, um I um I think the book resonated with me for a hundred reasons, uh, but one of which, you know, possibly number eighty nine reason was that I was 22 when I left home. I came to America and I was writing letters to my parents and God knows I was not putting everything in there. <laughs> you know, really, it really is parental guidance. It is, you know, no, 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 they don't need to know this. You know, they won't know how to handle it. Or like if you're sick or something, it's like, what's the point of telling them? You know, they're 10,000 miles away. They kept can't saying, do anything. I'm in, I'm in wonderful, I kept saying, I'm in wonderful health. I'm in wonderful health. And then I said, now that I've gotten better, since I've yeah. gotten better, I realized I <laughs> yeah. never told them that I was sick in the first yeah. place. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that, honestly, honestly, that is one of the great pleasures of writing to your parents because... You don't say everything. You know, I, I'm sure it's true for parents. It's one of the great pleasures of writing to children. You don't tell them everything. You know, I would come home um, in the summer from America and say, oh, this happened. Oh, I didn't know, you know, whatever, whatever. <laughs> but, but, but I've always been very curious about how you got to Shanti Niketan, because typically you would imagine if a young American scholar and you were already a budding scholar well on your way to well on your way to being the Wendy Doniger that we all admire. Why did you go to Shantini Ketan and not to Calcutta University or I don't know, um, JNU or something Good like question. that? So when I was at Harvard, so I, I was hardly on my way. I had just I finished my BA from Radcliffe and I had one year of my of an MA. That's all I had. So I was really really a, still a bud. Uh, and my professor was Daniel H. H. Eagles, the great Sanskrit, who was a southern gentleman from West Virginia, who really didn't like people of color, didn't like women, didn't like Jews. So I was a two-time <laughs> loser in his scale of unacceptable people being yeah. a Jew and a woman, but he liked me and he was nice to me. But he was very old-fashioned and he was worried about a young girl alone in India and so he thought, um, among other things, Shanti Niketan was more, of course, was Tagore's university, it's a great university. But at that time, it was also a kind of finishing school for upper class and girls. girls. And he thought, I would be safe there. I would be in the Borla hostel with all the other upper class ladies, and we would, you know, talk to each other, and there'd be no boys, and there'd be a trophy bar at the door to protect us. So he thought I would be safe it was right. It was a very easy entry. It wasn't about to smack in the middle of the slip. So I started with a world a little like the world I was used to. After so so. And also I was interested in Angla and culture. That was a great place to do it. I met the Tagore family right away. And then from there when I got Sea legs, kind of. I started branching out, uh, traveling. He was right. He, he may have moaned about some things, but he was right that certain cave was lovely, this gentle and uh, And, and was, it, was it really like, um, like a 20th century Gurukula? Was it really like that? I mean, did you study under the trees? Did you grow your own food? Did you wash your own clothes? Yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> we certainly did not. Um, we had servants. We did not wash our own clothes. 
a lady came in, took my clothes away, and basically smashed them on rocks. Yeah. We were supposed to have <clears throat> we were supposed to have all our classes under the trees, but we arrived in the monsoon. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the first time we said, well, class in Bangla, we tried to get to the trees. It was a downpour. No one could. So we all met under the tree and raced back into the buildings looking for a place to hold a class. But everyone else had also raced back into the building because they were supposed to be meeting under the trees too. <laughs> so we spent the whole hour looking for a place to meet. We never had a class. After a couple of days of this, the, the efficient American in the gun, I went to them. I said, look here. Why don't we just schedule the classes in the classrooms during the monsoon? They said, no, at Shanti Nikhazen, the classes are held under the trees. And so basically, during the monsoon, I didn't have any classes at all. But afterwards, the classes, when, when it wasn't a monsoon, we met under the trees. We did indeed meet under the trees. And um, how is it making friends? Was it difficult? Um, oh, was your, just so your general extroverted nature just, you know, um, made it simple? What, what, it just I, mean, I don't know why it was simple, but I right away met some wonderful people. What I found most interesting, you know, I read the letters myself after 15 minutes. It's almost like reading somebody else's letter. The loss of so long. Meeting the characters that I met, I met Miss Judy Roy, mm. who became friends. And then I met this wonderful Punjabi girl named Chancha, who is in many ways, I think, the heroine of the book a high-spirited, chubby, uh, fast-talking, sort of take-no-nonsense-from-anyone kind of a person who looked after me and took care of me and wrote, told wonderful stories. So she's in some ways the, the heroine. I met her right away. She immediately realized that I was helpless and stupid. She had to take care of me. She did everything for me. She yelled at my servant, they're not doing this right. She gave the food my and she was, mm -hmm. she was great. She had one of her stories. There's, there's some very sad stories from, in, from her. She told me about what it was like to be a, a Hindu in Lahore when particularly occurred and the killings. There's some rather dramatic and terrible stories in the letters that she told me. But she was also very funny. Her father was a Sikh and, and Chancel said she got into a lot of trouble once because when she was in school, when she was six or seven years old, they were learning English, and the teacher asked her what the word meat meant. And Chancel said it meant without ice. <laughs> and she got her father into a lot of. She told me about her grandmother, who was very high caste, very, very fussy about pollution, and she kept the kitchen really clean. And to teeth run in from outside and touch as many pots as she could and then run out again. And her grandmother then washed all the pots. So she's a great character in the letters. And Miss Tooney Roy, also very a serious, a beautiful, talented young woman. So, so I met these people in San Diego and I met people on trains. People were just nice to me. There was a time I was train from Bhopur, which is where Shantini Kaitan is down to Calcutta. And along the way, everyone was eating their lunch, and I didn't have anything with me. And a man said, aren't you eating your lunch? And I said, well, I had some, but I left them in Shanghai Caton. So when the next stopped, he ran out of the train, bought some food, it wasn't even bananas, and came back in and offered it to me. And he said, because you left your bananas in Shanghai Caton. <laughs> and that was a wonderful, it was a complete stranger. So yeah, yeah. I we sang songs on trains, we exchanged poems on trains, um, on buses yeah. too. I was on a bus yeah. once and the bus stopped. No, it was, it was a train. I was on a train and I had to wait for another train. And the train master invited us to his little honey and fed us some food and it was time for the train to leave. And I said, we better go. He said, no, they are. I'm the train master. <laughs> they have to wait for us. He insisted that we have more tea, and everybody is waiting, and finally we got on, and he started the train. And that's when I learned why it is that Indian trains were never on time. Things They're like that. Never on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So things yeah. like that happened. No, I mean, it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, trains, um, until fairly recently, this common salary in trains is just amazing, you know. Um, and on is singing together, sharing food, telling stories arranging marriages, all kinds of stuff. I mean, they become this little microcosm and um, 
children is used to be really lots and lots of fun. But it's nice that um, they took a foreigner in it. Wasn't it wasn't Indians with yeah, Indians? Yeah, it was an American yeah. girl. It was it was nice. They let me into that commonality. That yeah, was what yeah, 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 yeah. So, so many memories, Wendy, from that um, short year. Because yeah, what is your? Um, I have my favorite stories of the book. What is your um, standout memory? What what do you love to remember? What is the memory that gives you um, pleasure? I think there are, there are several. It's hard to choose one. But the, the first thing that comes to mind and that part of in the letters, it wasn't even a memory, is what I was reminded of when I read the letters. What I noticed and cared about was I was carried away by the beauty of the landscape and the climate by the stars at night, by the rain during the monsoon, walking in the countryside around Shanti Niketan, the way you saw a, a, a row of little boys on the top of a kind of a dike, just watching along, somebody playing a flute while he was herding cows straight out of a miniature painting of Krishna. It was very mythological to me, the way the landscape came to life and the way they, they, the architecture of the landscape, the way that the Hindu temples were like just sort of larger mounds than the other ones that we found in the side. And the way the way that the monsoon started, the way the monsoon ended. So a lot there's a lot of the sky at night, the amazing sharpness of it, the way people were in the monsoon, the way they didn't even try to stay dry but just ran around <laughs> wet and then went inside and changed their to, so I was amazed by the climate of the landscape. The other thing which I wrote a lot about, which I do remember very vividly, was that I learned a lot about one particular kind of Indian music, which was the Sharod, and in particular the playing of Ali Akbar Khan, whom I met in Calcutta and was sway with. And um, followed him around, he took me to his concerts, he helped me buy a charot and he taught me to play it. So I spent a lot of time learning about it. I wrote in the letters a lot about how what I loved about Indian music is that it went bump, 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 the way European music I knew went, but it went the way, the way it slurred between the notes. So I was, I was, it was my first real of that kind of Indian music. Um, I was very scornful of Ravi Shankar and the sitar. I also made music. They were, they were, the two played together. But I didn't really like Ravi Shankar. <clears throat> and I love the way he played. So there's a lot about, about that particular kind of music. It's a concert that after the concert is so, so that was that was near the end of my stay. That was in December. <clears throat> so it was after the concert. But I love that. that that's that's very powerful. That's yeah. yeah. But you know, again, I mean, um, seeing that I've known you for um, <coughs> just, um, well, more than half my life, um, these two things are very much the Wendy that I know. This sort of um, very profound or very um, deep connection with nature and you're always looking at the stars and in this case the ocean and and how much music is so, in your life I'll show you where i am here we're talking about nature so here yeah, I yeah. Am. show everybody where you are yeah, yeah. on the coast of uh, on the coast of cape cod this is cape cod bay this is there yeah, that's what i see from my window as i there's a marsh and beyond the marsh is the sea so so this is a happy place for me Say lots of birds to interrupt you. Well, go ahead. No. Go ahead. No. Um, I was wondering, um, since so much of you has stayed the same um, from the 22 year old girl to the soon to be um, 82 year old um, woman, um, what, what is there something you learned in India, like about, I don't know. Um, perhaps Hinduism, perhaps Shiva, perhaps people that still stands you in good stead today? It's 
certainly a thing that carried through the years in which I was reading manuscripts and texts and, and not being there, how people looked and moved and dressed. Women in Rajas carry big loads on their head, beautiful brass pots. Um, the different sorts of ways that people wore their saris, um, the different sort of that that Indian women have from from me, the people I knew, read about Gaya or Shakuntala or Kunti or uh, I had a person in mind. It wasn't just a, a character in a story. I thought of Miss sort of Chanchal. I thought of the the Indian women that I knew. I had a strong sense. I used to see how they put on their sari. They taught me how to put on my sari and so forth. So I had a, a, a strong sense of of the actual human qualities of the characters that I read about in the stories. I was also appalled by caste and the injustices and the poverty and the, of the people who were not at Shantani Caton uh, going to a finishing school. I saw I had I saw aspects of life in India that I'd never seen in America. Um, and it moved me very much. Um, the sadness it used to be begged for. So sad, I didn't know what to do at first. I used to give money to beggars, and my Indian friends said, Don't do it, don't do it, and so forth. There was a window in my my, my room, Shanti Niketan, <clears throat> and I would see her, I would hear from the distance. She would say, Ma, 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 and I'd hear the sound, and I knew that she was coming, and I would give her something that she Way, I was really deeply distressed, deeply distressed by the treatment of the Lord, by the suffering of of her poor people. At first, when I talk about being naive, I talked about seeing people sleeping in the streets in Calcutta, and I, I, I knew it was a fantasy. I had a fantasy that they would wake up and then go home. <laughs> I, I saw them with their children, and I said, well, you know, the children at least are well, even people who have nothing, at least they give what they have to the children. The children are all well-fed, and, so, and it wasn't true. Um, and I learned after a while that I was a uh, whistling Dixie, as we, as we say. Uh, so those yeah. things, on the one hand, the, the admiration of the beauty of the women, of the class women, and at the same time the suffering of other people, and all, all during my academic work, I was very, very sensitive to issues of past. I wasn't a sociologist, I wasn't writing about it, but it comes into all the stories you read in Sanskrit. And I was always, uh, when they talked about a beggar coming to the story, there's always sorts of about a beggar coming. <clears throat> I had an image, a very sharp image of that thing. Um, so those two extremes, um, the privilege of being among the upper classes in Bengal, which was so lovely, and at the same time, the growing awareness of something I had never noticed in my own country. This haunted me, helped me in my work, brought it alive. Um, those are things I, I carried away with me, and also the landscape. When it said he went out to the jungle, I, I could imagine the jungle. I saw the, I saw the landscape. So. And now um, you're going to have a tree planted in your name in the Sundarbans. How beautiful is that? What a beautiful circle for you to be able to close because the festival is going to do that. So, yeah, yeah. I would love so, listen, that. I, I'm going to use a segue. You said you um, were very, uh, very pleased to, to have Indian friends and, you know, to, to notice the way Indian women walked and how they carry loads on their heads. And, you know, what did you look like, my dear, when you were 22? I think there's a lovely picture on the cover <laughs> of your book, right? So, do you have it at There are very few you... pictures. I don't know. I, I lost the letters and the photographs. I found the letters 
in, 19, in 2018. I never found the photographs. I just have one or two short uh, uh, photographs in which I appear. So there is a picture on the cover of the book of me with my mother. Um, I don't know. You could, you, can you show it in this program? I don't know whether you have it or not. Yeah, I think you can do sh screen share. Can um, I do screen, screen share? share? I suspect so. Um, you don't have a copy of the book, do you? I don't have a copy of the book, yeah. but I have on my I have on my computer a copy of the cover. Um, so I want. Okay, Wendy. wait. Uh, we, yeah, yeah. Um, we just got a method saying Ashwini will show it to us. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So maybe he'll do that, and you can tell us also um, what your mother felt. Um, about coming to India and how she found you in India. Was it the same Wendy, a great oh, neck, or was funny. this another little girl? Yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful having, as I said, I, I was very close to my parents and I was homesick for them. Uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called The Donegars of Great Neck about my mother and my father. And um, I wrote these letters to them. And so uh, when my parents, we're going to come and visit me in India. That's how close I was. I mean, how many people do you know who have their parents come along on a research trip? So, <clears throat> so my parents, my parents were supposed to come at the last minute. My father couldn't come. There was a crisis. He was a publisher, and there was a crisis in his publishing company. And my mother came, and as you would have known from the other book, my mother was an extremely domineering, loud wonderful personality who sort of took over everything and bossed me around a whole lot. Where in India, she let me boss her around. It was <laughs> wonderful. I was in charge and she was very well behaved for most for the most part. She mm. was much braver than I was when we went to uh, Banaras or Varanasi. There was a man with a python. He said, would you like, he said to me, would you like to hold the python? I thought, no, I don't want to hold that damn python. My mother yeah. said, yes, please. And one of the photographs yeah. of the book is of my mother cheerfully holding the python. Yeah, and when yeah. we were in um, Madras, um, we went up into the hills to see a wonderful uh, Katakali performance of the Mahabharata. Uh, there's a picture of that in the book, too. And they, it was in a little tiny village, and they offered us food. And I had been sick a lot in India, and I'd, been very, I'd become very, I ate sort of like, hard-boiled eggs and bananas was what I was supposed to eat. And they brought us these trays, trays full of things. You couldn't even tell what it was. God knows what it was, you know, snake gizzards or something like that. And they gave it to both of us. And I looked at my mother and I said, and she smiled and she ate it and she ate it and she ate it. And she, it and she didn't even have the good grace to get sick afterwards. It was just fine. Yeah. So, yeah. so she had a lot of fun. She was good natured about the difficulties and, and when much later in 1991 when she was dying and we were by her bedside she turned to me and she said you know the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me in my whole life was the trip to visit you in India she said it was the uh, point so of her so life I was, so I was very moved by that she and I didn't always get on that well but we got on really well in India and then she said that at the end. So that was very, that was I'm really sorry that um, the parents' book, The Donegals of Great Neck, is not going to be published. Yeah, obviously, I mean, it doesn't have the same kind of uh, context. No. But, um, you know, uh, here's the companion book. It really, really is yes. a companion book to your yeah. memoir. Um, so we're going to see the book cover right now, but I want to keep talking. I want to talk to you about one very specific thing. Um, That's funny. Let's name. see the cover, then we'll keep talking. Okay. Yeah. There it is. The cover. There I am. It's in Mahabalipuram. I'm sitting on the Nandi on his little with my hands on his hump. And there's my mother leaning on it behind me. You can see we have the same basic shape of face. We have the same reddish hair. Um, there we are. It's a wonderful cover. Ravi Singh did a wonderful job. It's clever how they put the writing in the only meaningless parts of the photograph. It's really neat. Anyway, so that's one of a, of a few pictures that I still had um, from, from my visit to India. That's who I was and that's who she was. Okay, so what did you want to ask? So here's my great neck question. 
what did huh? they put in the water? Because there is another <laughs> great woman Sanskrit is from Great Neck, Long Island, yeah? Yeah, Barbara wanna, Stoller yeah, Miller. Barbara Stoller Miller, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very, was, she was a professor of Sanskrit at, at Columbia, at Barnard. We were in the same class at Great Neck High School and yeah. we were not friends. We moved in different factions. Um, I was what would have been a hippie, except it was the wrong years for it. What we called it then was a bohemian. I hung out in Bennett's village with artists and gay people, which was very risque of those days and so forth and so forth. And she wore cashmere sweater sets, you know, the, the, the very neat, neat. And I wore stuff like this even then. I was already, you know, dressing like this. So we didn't get along at all. We only got along years later when we were both grown up lady professors. Um, something about Great Neck, I don't know, to prove yeah, at, at one yeah. time, she and I were the only, it was before uh, uh, Roseanne Roche came, came to America. We were the only lady professors of Sanskrit in America. We were the same graduating class at Great Neck High School. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> really, really amazing. But let us now talk about um, your current work, right? Because you have retired, so they tell me. I've yet to believe it. Um, I know that you're not teaching anymore, but you're writing as much as ever. You're reading as much as ever. You're helping your students as much as ever, including me. You know that I never publish anything without your red pencil <laughs> going through it several times. Um, yes, but there's a big piece of you in my new book, too. So it's... Uh, oh, well, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it trades. So the, uh, and Ravi Singh is exclusively your publisher in India. God bless him for that. Ravi Singh um, is just so wonderful. Yeah. Yes. So I think it was Rachel Water, with whom we're going to talk to again, who once told me that in India, in some circles, he's known as Ravishing, which you yeah, get by yeah. putting H and Singh a little bit forward and so yeah, forth. But, yeah. uh, not yeah. only has so, he been very brave about publishing books of mine that have made some people cross, but he's also been very inventive. He's my editor. He goes through things and he says, why don't you say this? And why don't you change this? And why don't you tell me more about that? And in this last book, of course, he made a tremendous difference. He said, let's have the other half of the conversation. So um, so he's published yeah, uh, he's, almost yeah. all of my books in the last 10, 12 years, except the one which I thought was so localized that only New York Jews would buy it, basically. I didn't think it would go and come up. So, but all the so, others, and the ones I'm doing now yeah. also. Yeah, no, Ravi's a great editor. He edited my Ramana and, you know, I'm forever great. He's a wonderful editor. Um, yeah, yeah. He's also a great publisher. Let us say that, or oh, let us name the publishing house since everybody doesn't know who Ravi Singh is. Speaking Tiger. It's, it's Speaking Tiger. Speaking yeah. Tiger yeah, Books. Good. And uh, last year, I believe, you he um, you you published a book on horses, on which horses? is your other great passion in life. Yes. Is it not? It was and, also... One of the privileges of getting old, there are problems involved, but one of the privileges that you can write from the heart. You're not writing to impress. I am a great scholar. Look what I know. Um, you do that when you're little. But when you're yeah. grown up, you say, this is what I've found out about life that matters to me. And you write a different kind of a book. The Donegas of Great Neck was certainly, in a way, an apology to my mother, because as I said, we fought a lot. And the horse book, just put together everything I'd always loved about horses in my private life and how I'd always noticed horses in literature. Even in the horse book, I had just discovered the letters from India when I published the horse book. There's one passage describing a horse painted on the side of a house in the Bengal countryside, which I described in my letters. And I described it very well. I said it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Just a painted on the side of a mud hut that didn't have plumbing or anything, just a very simple house. So even the letters from India began to get into the horse book a little bit <laughs> by having that one horse, but also it's also the horses in the Rig Veda. It's also a scholarly book, you know, horses in the Mahabharata and all of that. And so it's a combination of my personal experience of horses with Alfred Benjamin, who grew up in yeah. India because her father was the commander in chief in India. Um, there's a story there too, of course, a different story. Uh, yeah, and yeah. so it's called Winged Stallions and Wicked Bears, Bears Horses yeah. in Indian Myth and Literature. And uh, that's the last book for this one that, uh, it's not the last book, 
Ravi then invented a book of dreams, cutting together several yes. pieces about dreams that I've written in the past, and I added another one, and there's a whole new book, which is really his book as much as my book, about the mythology of getting inside of other people's dreams, getting inside the mind of God. It's a very theological and philosophical book, really, for me. Anyway. And very much rooted in... Um the Yoga Vasishta and your book, Dreams, Illusions, and Other Realities. I mean, Rachel was talking about in your introduction how you have the best titles. This is my favorite title of all your books, Dreams, Illusions, and Other Realities. And much of the much of the Ravi Singh um, Dreams book, I think, comes, comes out of there. But you are still doing massive scholarly work. You have a translation of the Mahabharata. Not the Mahabharata, but the last five books of the Mahabharata coming out next month, right? That's right. Um, that's right. Um, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. It's coming. It's it's coming out in America, maybe Oxford next month, and it's coming out in India in August, I think. Yes, um, it's called yes. After the War: The Last Books of the Mahabharata, and it's a translation of the last books of the Mahabharata, but it's also an introduction and discussion because, again. Just as I think the letters book has something to say about our quandary now about our shameful past as, 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 a, as a planet, um, so too um, in the Mahabharata, the last books are the heroes coming to terms with their shameful past. Looking back upon the war and all the terrible things they did, the, the people they killed that they shouldn't have killed, the whole war which shouldn't have happened, and in particular, it's about the word manyu, which is a wonderful Sanskrit word for which there's no single English equivalent, which means anger, pride, righteous anger, vengeance. How dare you do that to me? Now that you've done that to me, because I am an aristocrat, I will do something to you. All of that is in manyu. And it's what kept the Mahabharata battle going on for so many years, because they did this to Draupadi, so we'll just do this to you because they did the night raid, we'll do this to you, and so forth and so on. And so in the last books, they come to terms with this. They try, They go to heaven, they find their enemies in heaven, and they say, I don't want to be in heaven if he's there. So the battle threatens to go on even in heaven until they realize they, they never should have been fighting with these people in the first place. So it's really an extraordinary book, the, the, last, yeah. the last quarter of the Mahabharata. And it's yeah. quite relevant, I think, to uh, other things that we're thinking about today, and yeah. Ukraine and other places on the planet and so forth. So that was a lot of fun to rethink. I've been yeah. working on it for years, but I finally put it together in this, in this last year. Um, yeah, it's, it's it. amazing how the Mahabharata changes after the war. I mean, it becomes like a different genre almost of it writing really and thinking and... Um, yeah, it's it's um, meaningful, you know, to to read it as well, as you said in our times. Um, it's, many it's, of it's us a, it, it, it many forms things, yeah. a, it forms a piece. I mean, I translate it partly because there are fairly good translations of the first few books of the Mahabharata. Um, they were done um, at Chicago um, some years ago, and there are pretty good translations with the play and pictures of some of the little books. But no one has ever really properly translated the last books. Yeah. The E.C. Roy translation, of course, is always there. Uh, when John Smith did his translation, he did do hardly any of it. He left out most yeah. of the last books. Yeah. So there's a real academic need for an accurate translation. But I think there's also a need for people who didn't know they were interested in the art yeah. to yeah. to read about what, what we learned from this book. So, so that's yeah. coming out also, yeah. also from our thing. Yep. I think many of us need a moral re-examination, and this is a great prompt at a very, very, very difficult time yeah. Um, yeah. in our lives. And um, yeah, so I'm going to invite Rachel to join us, Wendy, since she's a friend of both of ours, and she yeah. too was once a little girl or a young woman <laughs> writing letters <laughs> home from India, perhaps. Did you, Rachel? Did you write letters home from India? I did, but perhaps not as often. I was wondering, I mean, um, Wendy was more in one place, whereas I was moving around, remembering the old post restaurant and going to see if, you know, you had any letters from home. 
Yeah. But I mean, I'd grown up with a father who was in the Navy, so I was kind of used to living relationships through letters from a very early age. Um, I just look back and I think, what did my parents think they were doing? You know, I was a teenager and just went off to India on my own with a backpack and hardly any money. Wow. And, so you were know, even younger than I was. Mm, How old I, were you? 19. Were you? 19, wow. Oh, you beat me by But three you years. know, I mean, yeah, I know. I'm all. I've already reached that age. Oh, you know, our time was the golden age, nostalgia, this and that. But there's something about writing those letters because I know I used to sit down every Sunday evening and write three pages, both sides, to my parents, where I would tell them what had happened in the week, kind of, sort of, right? And they did the same thing. And the the sort of um, the leisure with which you wrote letters, you know, and you came back to them. And email has such a such a sort of instant quality to it that I, you know, I think we process our own experiences so differently in email yeah. rather than we do in letters. But Rachel, I'm sure you have questions for Wendy too. I've been doing all the, the um, interlocuting. Would you like to interlocute for a little while? <laughs> I mean, it was so fabulous to hear you. I mean, you know, I'm very worried. You know, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm I'm very British, and you know, if I say something's nice, that means wow, it was amazing and wonderful. And you know, <laughs> you're just saying everything was wonderful, and I mean, you know, it's very, yes. understatement has never been one. Of, understatement has <laughs> never been one of my problems. <laughs> never, so, never, uh, never, never. Yeah. But you know, the I other mean, thing about the letters, the letters that I wrote, they were very long. Some of them are twelve single spaced yeah, pages. Yeah. I meant them as a way of keeping in touch with the two people I love best, but they were also my field notes. I, I didn't, I know, I also was traveling, Rachel, and I afraid I was going to lose things. So I wrote out everything and I sent it home so I'd have it safe. So that when I got back, a lot of it is about science fiction texts I was facing. So it, I was also sort of writing to myself in some ways. Yeah, as yeah, well yeah. As with them so it's like a, not like a diary because I didn't put those into them anyway go ahead Rachel no I mean and I think that's fascinating and that idea of you know being I mean you know my parents would have probably been surprised if I'd written anything very personal to them <laughs> at any point you know <laughs> I mean, you were British. What, what could you do? You were British. You know, one of my sorry. friends went on an American field trip, and I mean, on you know English speaking Union, and she was eight, eighteen, I think, and she was away for a year, and she once rang home, and her father said, "Are you unwell?" And she said, "No, and he said, well, no need to call and put the phone down on her." But even no, I, I left things out. The other thing I left out, I remember, <clears throat> was uh, at Durga Puja. Um, they gave us a, um, a lovely little milkshake to drink, and I had it. it was delicious, and I'm, I've always been greedy. I said, "Can I have another?" And everybody laughed, and I sort of realized there was a reason. So I had another, and of course it was hot. It was liquid marijuana. So I be and I wasn't much of a drinker. I never did drugs. I wasn't that kind of a teenager. I, tell you, I was a sheltered girl. So I got stoned out of my mind, and so my notes on Durga Puja are very, very slight. They're the, the shortest part of the book, in a way. Um, and I did not tell my parents about that. That's just going to be what I keep students. But I remembered it vividly. I was with Ed Dimmick from the University of Chicago, and uh, we drove around the night on an open jeep. He was stoned, too. Someone else was driving. There was a driver. And as we went around the Maidan, it was dark, it was unlit in those days at least. He thought we were in Chicago and it was Lake Michigan and he wanted to go and swim in it. We had to keep Professor Dimmick from jumping out of the jeep to go swim in it. Those things did not get But I wonder about this, you know, also um, both Rachel and Wendy, that, you know, when we write these letters that are somehow to ourselves, right? Yes. Um, it's... it's um, it's a really odd combination of mythologizing our lives and telling the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. there's, a, mm -hmm. there's a sort of sense of you're creating a self, yeah, that perhaps yeah. your older, older self will find and read. Or your parents yes. will say, oh, my darling daughter, I'm so proud of you, when actually you're the devil, you know? Uh, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, a lovely, um, yeah. it's a lovely tension. It's a really beautiful negotiation. Um, I, because I was writing to, but you're absolutely right. And both because I was writing to them and because I was trying to cheer myself up when I was terribly homesick, 
I pretended to like everything more than I did. And I was ashamed that I wasn't able to like everything in India. I lied to myself. I didn't really mind this. I didn't really mind this. So there's, there's that big lie going on through all the letters. I very occasionally say how nice it was to get to a place where I, where I had a clean bed. And only then did you know that I'd been sleeping under conditions that had bothered me because of their bad quality and I'd slept well and so forth. So you are trying to create mythologize, brave traveler, everything, I, I, the more obstacles I encounter, the more fun I have and all of that. Whereas you're really frightened part of the time and disappointed part of the time and sick part of the time. And it, it creeps it creeps into the letters sometimes. In a negative way, I say, I'm not homesick anymore. I say, oh yeah, well, I guess I must have been homesick or something like that. Because you are creating a self for your own self to be proud of later on. That's the person in the India we think. call your good self, Wendy. That is your good your self. Good self. Yeah. You and leave out the thing that, that you're yeah. 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 And I was also well, thinking, you know, it must have been very different. I mean, obviously, you know, going in the 60s and I went in the 80s, you know, different times, of course. But also when you were going with a Brit, you were suddenly facing a whole bit of British history that you'd done a bit of at school but didn't really know. And suddenly it was like, oh, my God, here it is. And, you know, yeah. wasn't expecting yeah. to see you here or you here. And, you know, yeah. I don't know if it's an American if it felt different. Um. I was grateful at first for the things that the British had done. I was glad that the signs were in English, things like that. Uh -huh. oh, thank God for that. Now I know where I am and stuff like that. Um, but I'd also seen, even when I was in England, it was interesting, the very first letter is from London before I ever got on the plane to Calcutta. And I had interviewed Jane Wu and her husband, who had um, been the architects of um, Chandigarh. The Kurhuas look over the design city. And I asked them, even then, I said, what do you do when you get sick in India? It's interesting that even then I was worried that I was going to get sick, as indeed I did. And Jane Blue said, well, we go to England. And I said, well, <laughs> what do the Indians do when they get sick and in England? And she said, they go to England. So there I am with this colonial bullshit in my head. And I get on the plane and I land in, in India. So I was aware of the British of India and so forth. And Tagore had a lot to do with the English world. Wrote so I was in a borderline, borderland in a way in, in the beginning. And I got deeper and deeper into India itself as I, as I moved on. Um, but I did go as an American rather than as an English woman, and it made a, a big difference. The horse book that Arsha referred to, which has a lot in it about Penelope Betjeman, much later, well, not that much later, actually, in 1965, two years after I got back from um, India, I moved to England for 10 years, and I spent those 10 years riding horses with Penelope Betjeman, and that's when I really got to know British India. Um, and she told me what it was like growing up in government house and so forth. So I was not aware of Indian history. I've never been to the story. I always liked to read the texts. So I wasn't really that much aware of Indian, of the English part of Indian history when I got there. And I gradually discovered it more and more. And I learned about partition largely from Chanchal and hearing um, her horror stories of what it was like to be during the, the terrible violence of it. So... I began to learn uh, history when I got there, um, and it was an important lesson. But it well, was ancient India that brought, I mean, I, I mean, I didn't really realize till I looked at the book about, you know, that you'd done Bengali, and I, I had no idea, actually, and because I always think of you as being very much, you know, interested in ancient India and the Sanskrit. Well, world. well, when I went there, as I said, until I went to that goat sacrifice, I had thought that I actually might um, be um, an anthropologist. I wasn't sure that I was only going to do Sanskrit. And I wanted to learn Bangla because I liked what I knew of Bengali literature. <clears throat> and I stayed with Ed Dimmock, who was the great scholar of Bangla 
um, in America. In fact, one of, my, one of the best stories in the book, I love this story, it's about Ed Dimmick. <clears throat> so he had five children. And he took them with him when he went, and a wife, and he took them all with him when he went to India. So they had this long flight. In those days, it took a long time to get from Chicago, which is where it was, to stop in London and in Beirut and all these other damn places. And finally, he arrived in Calcutta at Swinhoe Street, in Valley Gardens, in the middle of the night. The five children had vomited on themselves and peed on themselves and pooped on themselves and were exhausted and were crying in the middle of the night and the, and the house was locked. So he rang and shouted and banged and finally the Tokyo guard got out of bed and came and started opening the house and Ed was so furious he yelled at the Tokyo guard in Bangla. He told them what he thought of him and his mother and his sister and his relationship to his sister and went on and on and on with this fluent Bengali curses. Finally, he ran out of breath and he was immediately sorry because he knew it wasn't the Chokidar's fault. And anyway, he was a very nice man at the, and he was a Unitarian minister. So before he could apologize, he was getting ready to apologize. The Chokidar said, Shai, mahalo bandlo basa bote bandlo. Sir, how well you speak bandlo. Okay, and I'm going to have to story. end this now. Yeah, I'm going to have to end this now. We have literally a minute, but how appropriate, Rachel, that you should be with us this evening. And how very, very appropriate that we end with a Wendy story because she's she one of the great storytellers of the world. And God knows she has a story for every occasion. So, um, yeah. in Bangla, India, or was not, the, in, India was the greatest story of them all. India was the great story. So well, thank you thank both you. very, very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, thank Arsha. You. Thank you, Chris Wan Singh. Did you ever meet him, Wendy? I never did. I never did. But I know of him through Arsha. Lovely. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who I, I mean, I knew when I was a little girl, and one of the things I loved best about him is he never treated me like a little girl. He spoke to me as if I was an adult. I was 11. And That's, I sort of got used to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good yeah. Excellent. So we look forward to the book's publication shortly from Speaking Tiger. Wonderful. Mm. Thank, thank you. Thank you both and thank you, 